Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at Telerik.com slash platform. That's Telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 527. In this episode, Scott talks with Aja Hammerly about practical containers and how they affect workflow. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, we're talking with Aja Hammerly, who is a cloud developer advocate with Google. Thanks for chatting with me today. Hello. This is great. So we're going to talk about containers. We're talking about microservices. And uh, I know it's funny to start a podcast with those two buzzwords because those are the buzzwords. Uh, everyone is saying this. Why is containers and microservices like so talked about? Why is it? Have we, re- have we reached peak buzzword with these two things? So... I think it really helps to like take a step back and think about the problems that people have had with microservices. So before I was at Google, I was a, a contract developer and a Rails developer for about eight years. Mm-hmm. And microservices became huge in the Rails community. But one of the big problems people had was deployment and managing huge quantities of separate um, separate services, separate sites that had different scaling requirements, different performance characteristics. Maybe some of them needed access to two databases, a primary and a data warehouse, and others were completely independent of a database. And containers have kind of come along as a potential solution to that big frustration. And I had really no idea what containers could do until about 18 months ago when I started hearing Docker talked about at a lot of conferences. Mm -hmm. And now that I've had a little experience with them, I think there's a lot of potential for folks running complicated deployments, whether that's multiple services, multiple websites, needing to better utilize their VM resources, or folks who are just doing things that are cross cloud. You need to have you need to have your stuff in multiple data centers. And all that stuff I think containers can help with a lot. So that's kind of I think why they're coming up right now. And I mean I totally get that they're a buzzword. I think every conference I've been to in the last year has had a containers talk of some sort, even if I wasn't giving it. So Yeah. Um, I'm one of the uh, chairs this year of OzCon and uh, we're getting complaints from some folks uh Folks, maybe with a little bit more historical context, uh, who are saying that, uh, oh, this, it's all just containers and microservices talks. Like, that's just the buzzword that we're going to use this year. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to answer those because sometimes they are the buzzwords that we need today. Like, this is, like you said, more than a buzzword. It's a solution to an, an actual real world problem that people are having. Yeah. And, um, I think there's a lot of pushback on the fact that it's a buzzword, but the bottom line is container technology is really cool. The idea that you mm-hmm. can take an application, package it up with all of its dependencies, and take it in a package, whether that's a Docker container or a Rocket container or some custom container format, because Google's mm-hmm. been using containers and custom container formats for quite a while, and push that out anywhere and not have to worry about making sure that all your dependencies are installed, not having to worry about if your library, library source, like something like rubygems.org or npm, is down mm-hmm. or whether somebody's pushed an extra version of a library and you didn't get your dependencies quite right. Just knowing that if you have that box of the application, its dependencies and its file system all ready to go, and you can push that out anywhere, you want to push that out to multiple clouds, you want to push that out to your test system, you want to push that out to a pre-prod system that your sales and marketing team use for making promotional videos. All of that's just super easy at that point. And it changes how you think about ops. It changes how you think about even your deployment pipeline. That's one of the things that I really struggled with when we were thinking about using this for a huge microservices site I was working on. Uh, Mm -hmm. We had, I think, seven different code bases and three different languages on that site, all to run one site. And we were like, okay, we need to come up with a way to deploy this in a reasonable fashion that can be, it was contracting work, so it needed to be something that our contracting client could pick up from us. And, you know, a 50-step deployment guide was, wasn't going to cut it. And so we talked We talked about using containers, and we were working on containerizing it when I ended up le- getting switched off the project. And the idea was that if we could make a system that would build out the containers with Docker, 
all they would have to do is find a web host, and there are lots of them, who would be willing to host the containers in a managed fashion. And that made the whole deployment process so much easier for our customer and also for us because it meant that the deployment was always consistent, whether that was in our mm -hmm. disaster recovery system, which was in a completely different cloud vendor than our primary cloud vendor. It all, it all worked out and it was very, very consistent. And I think that's the big thing that a lot of people are missing with containers because a lot of the talks I've been seeing and a lot of the blog posts are about the deep level. This is how we make containers work in the Linux kernel. But the practical how do I use them day to day as a day to day developer seems to be still a little bit of a mystery. And if you just think about it as a way of packaging your site with the dependencies and everything else ready to go, it gets a little easier and it gets a little more obvious how that would benefit you. I mean, repeatability is the golden standard in deployment and as someone who also did QA in the testing world, you want stuff to be the same every single time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like, I, th I think you're right. In in so many conferences, it's a, you know, let's do Docker 101. And then they're like, here's how we talk to the kernel. And that's not that's not necessarily what I want to hear about, right? Like, I want to turn on the faucet and have there be water. I don't want to learn how to do plumbing, you know what I mean? Yeah. And while plumbing may be fascinating, it doesn't help me practically in my life. Yeah. And I think that's one of the big things. I did a series of blog posts on how to do a basic Rails site, very basic Rails site in um, Docker with Docker containers and then deploying with Kubernetes, which is one of the current uh, contenders in the space of container management. That one happens to be at least partially authored by Google. So I have a little more detailed knowledge of it, but it's entirely open source. There's a lot of, there's mm -hmm. more contributors outside of Google at this point than there are inside, which is awesome. And mm -hmm. there's some pretty big uh, stumbling blocks if you're thinking about a system like Rails or a system like Django and containerizing. First of all, where do you put the database? How does that go? And that's always a huge stumbling block for folks. Another stumbling block is, well, how do you deal with database migrations? But at the same time, if you do the work up front, and there's generally pretty good patterns for solving those stumbling blocks, you also get some pretty cool benefits. Containers make uh, auto-scaling fairly easy because you have this box, uh, this package that is your app. And there's a lot of folks who do auto-scaling by just making more VMs. But the cool thing about containers is that I can put the same container multiple times on one VM and I get additional throughput. I get additional capacity for my site. And that's really handy for all doing things like auto-scaling. And Kubernetes supports that uh, as of, I believe, the 1.1 release. And some of the other container management tools coming out from other cloud vendors also support that. And so there's a lot of cool advantages. Um, and the actual day-to-day -day packaging up of the container is not that hard because Docker's have been great. Docker Hub has example containers for pretty much every web framework that you'd want as long as it runs on some flavor of Linux. So if you have Rails, you want Nginx, you want Django, there's a, there's a container sitting out there that you can at least use as a starting point. And there's a lot of folks who will say those containers are big. The Rails container in particular has database drivers for both MySQL and Postgres. And I, m most folks don't need both of those. Most folks would benefit from only having one. But it at least gets you started. It makes the barrier to entry actually a lot smaller than you get when you're sitting there listening to the, and this is how we hacked the kernel to do this following thing. If you just actually sit down and try it, it's really not that hard, which surprised me a lot. I actually did a talk called DevOps for the Lazy, using containers as a way to be lazy. <laughs> Because once you have about once you have it bundled up, the deployment part's actually pretty simple because you're letting Docker or some hosted container service do it for you. Mm -hmm. So let me let me go back and grab a couple of words in what you said and and dig a little bit deeper into them because one thing that you said was consistency, mm -hmm. and then you also said a number of times not worrying, not worrying, which made me realize that there's been many many years uh, where we live in fear of our deployments, yeah. right? And this is bigger than continuous integration and continuous deployment. It's just like, I don't really know if these 15 machines in the web farm all have the same bits on them and if they're consistent and if they are in fact what I wanted to, to deploy. Yeah. And so let's talk about the consistency side first. Um, mm -hmm. So there are lots of ways to deal with consistency. And again, I'm coming from a Ruby and Node background, so I'm sure that other web frameworks have better or worse or similar ways of dealing with this. But uh, in Ruby land, especially Rails land, and even in Node, you spend a lot of time stringing together other people's libraries, and then you're pulling those from some canonical source, whether that's npm or rubygems.org, or the equivalent at ver for various other web frameworks. And as anyone who's done that professionally knows, those services are almost always uh, labors of love by the community. People aren't paying to keep mm -hmm. rubygems.org up or npm.org up. It's actually not entirely true in Ruby, Ruby land now because there's a group of companies that have decided to sponsor rubygems.org. But they decided to sponsor it because they needed it to be up and they needed it to be consistent. 
And I've been bitten um, by a developer on my team not being careful enough with the version dependency and having a library we needed version in some breaking way and only half the machines getting it because of we did the rollout over a course of several days or we auto scaled up um, two days after a release. And in that two days, a new version of something came out and it broke half of the machines. And as someone who's done ops and testing, the worst thing in the world is a bug that only repros half the time. <laughs> especially when you can't figure out exactly what half the time is. And when you're round robining requests, that makes it even harder. And so the, one of the things I like about containers is that you build that container once and then every single machine gets the exact same bits. And whether those bits are the ones you want is, you know, that's up to your QA process and your build process, but at least all the machines have the same bits and all the machines have the same base file system too. Um, I know lots of folks who are slowly upgrading, like they've, they've, put in a long-term contract with their cloud vendor for a specific machine type, and they now, need, now they need extra machines. So they're going to have some of their machines be an older machine type and some of their machines be a newer, more powerful machine type. And for the most part, it shouldn't matter. But if you're doing a lot of stuff, like you're doing a lot of um, file processing, image processing, video transcoding, uh, maybe the difference in disk size or the difference in GPUs matters. And when you have containers, you have a little bit more access to controlling that, especially if you use uh, attached attached to network disks as opposed to using the disk inside mm -hmm. your container. Um, so that's kind of the thing on the consistency. And that a lot of that's coming from fear from my place because, I mean, I carried a pager for three years working in ops and QA. And the worst thing I hated was when something didn't repro and test. And I know because I've done these container deployments now that the machine that I deploy, the set that I deploy locally is exactly the same set of code or the, the stuff that I deploy to the server that sits under my desk is exactly the same code and will behave in exactly the same way when I deploy it to the cloud, assuming that the base OS is the same and getting the base OS mm -hmm. to be the same is easy. So, Yeah, before containers, I felt like I was either fighting with the file system in my deployment to make sure it was consistent and reliable. And I would always end up with, you know, one file being, you know, some file being out of date. And then of course, then it's a flaky bug you have to go hunt down. Or on the other side, do everything with virtual machines, mm -hmm. which were so heavy. It's like, this is only a hundred megabyte web application. Let me go and deploy this 30 gigabyte VM image that gets, you know, gets me what I need. And it seems like containers, you know, kind yeah, of split the do, difference. they do. They do, especially in production. They do have the disadvantage of at least I I do all my development on a Mac, and I still have to run virtual machines to host my containers. But it's it's different than right. when I had to do all my development against a virtual machine, which I did for nine months because we deployed, we set up a uh, a virtual machine image that we all used that mirrored pretty closely our production image, and then we all had to SSH into the local virtual machine and do our do all of our development and testing via SSH and SCP. And it was just, it was, it was incredibly painful. But the reason we had to do that was that was the only way to make it so that on a contracting team where we had people cycling in and out every couple months, everyone's dev environment was close mm -hmm. enough to production that we wouldn't end up with crazy incompatibilities when we pushed. And that was with a team that was doing a good job of continuous integration and relatively continuous deployment. We were deploying a couple times a week. And we did a pretty good job of testing and code reviews and we still had those problems. So the fact that mm -hmm. containers, we, we were looking at containers specifically because we needed something a little more lightweight and a little more consistent. And I mean, there's great tools for configuring your, your systems. I mean, there's things like Chef and Puppet and I've used them and they're wonderful, but they don't have the advantage of having everything be neatly packaged off with a bow when you hand it over to the ops team. And that's one of the patterns I'm actually seeing a lot with teams that use containers is the development team is responsible for building the containers. They're responsible for making sure that their container is set mm. up and then they pass it over the wall to ops as a prepackaged bundle that ops, all they have to do is make sure that there's enough places to put that container on the hardware, whether that's virtual or on-prem hardware or whatever the team has. The ops team is just responsible for deploying that container into the, into the data center and possibly helping with some of the networking steps. But actually getting all the dependencies right. is no longer that, the operations team's responsibility. That is such an important point, and I'm really glad that you brought that up because there have been so many times where I felt that the responsibilities of of ops, you know, kind of their lines were blurred and they were into my space, and I wanted a certain file, f you know, installed on the machine or some global dependency, and I had to fill out forms and ask permission and, you know, get I couldn't get into a locked machine because ultimately what it came down to, the root cause was my app 
wasn't neatly packaged up with all dependencies all the way down to the operating system. It went down just halfway. And then there were, you know, I had to give them a Word document, for God's sake, you know, with a list of other, you know, global dependencies. Yeah, I, I will admit up. that at some point in my distant past, I figured out what the bribery for a particular ops team was, and it happened to be a specific kind of candy. And I more than one occasion knocked on the door to the knock with a, you know, handful of candy. And I'm like, here, now can you please give me SSH <laughs> access or, you know, Telnet access or whatever I needed so that I can go see the raw logs on this machine so I can debug this issue. And the thing yeah. is, I tell this story to folks, yeah. and most of the folks who've been in the industry for you know more than four or five years have a similar story where they've had to do some sort of bribery or you know late night dealing or mm -hmm. pushing pushing things up to three levels of managers in order to get access to actually debug their their issues and. Anything that can help make the, those lines a little bit cleaner, I think, makes everyone happy because it makes the developer happy because they know that what they've set up will be what actually gets deployed and that there isn't going to be someone saying, no, actually, I think mm -hmm. this other version of this library is safer, or more secure. And at the same time, ops is not going to have to deal right. with feeling responsible for debugging, uh, you know, a doc that's got 80 deployment steps because, you know, I think we've, a lot of us have worked on that app. You have to pull in all of these dependencies. You have to install these particular resources in this particular order. You have to start the apps. There's a microservices app in the following order. Otherwise, the database connections don't get resolved. And mm -hmm. most of the ops folks I know would love to get out of that business. So I think the container, I think the containers model where the development team deploys, hands over this package and says, make this go, um, is going to make everyone happier mm -hmm. once we get used to it. And that's the big, that's the big challenge. Right. And at that point, at that point, they just have to think about there's a, a box mm -hmm. and there's a port, right? And make it talk to that yeah. port. And that's there, pretty much the, the job. And perhaps there's some service discovery stuff. Although if you're going to use one of the managed, slightly managed container services from the big cloud providers, that that solves itself on its own. And, or at least they have easy ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And most of the ops teams I know are pretty good about setting up the, the basic network rules. And those don't change in container land. It's because again, it's, it's a port. It's a port on a box. Can we talk about that for a second? You, you've mentioned a couple of different uh, container services. Like once you have containers, once you've picked your container technology, there are things to manage them because it's very rare that you're going to have an app that lives in one container and you upload that one container and that's the end of at the end of it. You might start it. You might get the container bug and now it's a dozen and then it's two dozen. The next thing you know, you're managing a swarm of hundreds of containers. What are some examples of container services? I work for Google. We have, um, we are one of the main sponsors behind the Kubernetes project. We have a bunch of folks working on Kubernetes here. And Kubernetes, uh, for folks who are familiar with the ops space and some of the technologies at Google, Google runs a lot of stuff on something called Borg. And what Kubernetes is, is Google taking a lot of the things we learned about how to run containers at scale, the kinds of challenges that are common, and we took those lessons from Borg and wrote Kubernetes from scratch. And what Kubernetes does is it says, you mm -hmm. specify what you want the end system to look like. Um, I have a deep fondness for uh, programming languages that are declarative, where you say what you want, not how to do something. And so you might say, I have this front end app mm -hmm. container that I want at least, I want six instances of it. I have a back end job processor that, you know, maybe sends out an email or maybe does a video transcoding or something in the background. And I want three instances of that. And then I have this database container and I only need one instance of that, but it needs a persistent disk attached to it because I don't want to. Um, one of the pitfalls of containers is that general best practices, you should be prepared for your container to die at any time, not because they do, but because the advantages of containers are that you can move them around. And so if you need something like a database, which a lot of people are kind of iffy about putting in containers, but I've done it and it works great. Um, you just need to have a disk, some sort of block store or disk that you've attached to the container that it can put the, the database files on. And with Kubernetes, you say, you just specify out in YAML or JSON, this container name, this many instances, this container name, this many instances. And then we also provide a way through Kubernetes to do discovery where you can say, everything in this container is part of this service. And so you can hook the containers together via the service names pretty easily. And Figuring out which IP that is and round robining and stuff is all taken care of for you uh, once you have a Kubernetes cluster up and running. And I'm, I will admit, for me at least, setting up a Kubernetes cluster is way more complicated than I want to get into. Luckily, hosted Kubernetes exists. Mm -hmm. Google calls it Google Container Engine. Um, and so that's one option. There's also tools like Docker Swarm, which I've played with a bit. Uh, it's a little bit lighter weight. Um, mm -hmm. It's not designed... 
to do all the niceties of service discovery and stuff for you. Uh, I know Amazon has their container product. I know some folks who work on it. And it has, some, again, some slight uh, philosophy differences on how containers should be managed from Kubernetes. And that's one of the things I find interesting about this space is that there's a couple companies who've been playing in it for a while and actually using containers in production for a while. And they all seem to have different opinions on best practices. And it'll be interesting over the next year or two as more people pick up containers to see which best practices seem to come out. I have a fondness for the Kubernetes system, partly just because I'm most familiar with it, but also because anyone who takes care of my networking and my service discovery for me is going to get massive bonus points because I find that stuff tedious. So if I can just say, hey, I need five versions of this mm -hmm. container and they should all respond to this name and we should automatically round robin between them. Uh, and I can do that all in six lines of YAML. I'm, I'm all, I'm all in on that. That, that's great because it lets me be lazy. <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, there's, there's, I mean, those are the three big ones that I know of. I'm sure there are more that I'm not 100% aware of. Um, and I know that there are more people coming out with different ways mm -hmm. of managing containers every single day. Like when I started working on this a year ago, the list was entirely different. So it's one of those rapidly changing right. things based on people's, um, opinions and based just also based on people's experiences of running containers in production and what ends up being hard. Right, right. It seems like right now there's, you know, like a bit of a, I wouldn't say a cold war, but you know, like there's just lots of different people doing lots of different innovations. And from the people on the outside who maybe aren't doing containers, they're hearing all of these strange new words, whether it be Kubernetes mm -hmm. or Zookeeper or Mesos or Swarm. And they're wondering how all these things plug into each other. And, and whether the layer cake that they would be choosing as a company would be the right layer cake. And then, of course, the bottom layer of the cake would be the cloud that they, yeah. that they pick, that they put the thing on. And in the past, you know, cross cloud has been kind of a myth, hasn't it? Like there's always been vendor lock in at some point. But do you think containers could allow us to really have, uh, you know, cloud portability? See, that's my big hope. And when I go to conferences and I'm talking to folks, and since I work at Google and I'm an advocate for Google Cloud, I'm talking to folks about Google Cloud. And very few of the big to medium sized companies I've been talking to really want to stick with one cloud. And they're like, well, how can we, how can we do this so that, you know, on the off chance that there's a massive outage or, just, you know, I mean, stuff happens. Intercontinental fiber cables get eaten by, get bitten, bitten apart by sharks and stuff, right? Lightning storms happen. How can we make it so that we yeah. can stay up even if, uh, this happens and one of our vendors go down? I mean, every major cloud provider has had at least a regional outage that people in the industry have heard about. And the nice thing about mm -hmm. containers is that as, as long as you can get Docker or whatever your container runner is on some version of Linux that supports it, you can move your containers anywhere and you can just pick them up wholesale. Um, that doesn't deal with the data piece if you're writing to your cloud provider's specific storage. But most of the cloud providers I've talked to, and I've been on panels with folks from Microsoft and AWS, they're all like, no, we, we want to make it so that you can move because competition is good for us in this space. And I, I really believe that's true. And the nice thing about containers, though, is that unlike yeah. some of the platform as a service stuff where you get locked into a specific runtime and a specific set of tools that a provider might support, uh, if you if you can do the upfront effort, and it is a little more effort than just deploying to something that's a platform as a service where you're just like, here's my Git repo, go. Um, if you can do the upfront effort, it right. gives you more portability. I can take the same containers that I ran on Google Container Engine. I can run them on hardware that I have, physical hardware that I've bought. And that's what a lot of folks that I've been talking to are doing. They need, they, they're still trying to convince their upper level management that the cloud is a good idea but they want to be prepared for it. So they're starting out by mm. getting all their stuff internally containerized, partly because it lets them use their limited hardware resources better. They can run multiple apps on a VM in ways that they don't collide. But also it means that when it's time to move to the cloud or when they have that really good day or they go viral, they can add capacity quickly because they have this image that they can deploy and start up in a couple minutes. It's like a Kubernetes cluster uh, running Rails. I can get the whole thing up and running, including downloading the images from Docker Hub in less than five minutes. And that's awesome compared to how long some of my deployments took with tools like Chef and Puppet, where I was having to do multiple passes to get all of the environment variables and everything set correctly. Right. And that's something that people almost need to see to believe. Like yeah, yeah. I there's a there's a great video done by one of my coworkers, uh, Brian Dorsey, where he had one of the lead developers on Kubernetes uh, timed uh, making a latte versus starting up a Kubernetes cluster. And it was, it was kind of ridiculous, but it also pointed it out. And one of the demos I like to do with containers is I like to, 
kill one of the VMs that I'm using to run my set of containers and then watch the scheduler move them around so that I don't mm -hmm. lose um, any capacity. And, you know, you hope that your VM doesn't die, but sometimes mm -hmm. they do. You hope that your hard drive doesn't die, but sometimes they do. And sure. seeing that the whole thing can be reconfigured in less than two seconds, and it really is that fast, is just amazing. Because coming from a world where I did ops manually, I, I, I couldn't recover from an, I couldn't recover from a disk failure that quickly. Like, I remember getting in the car with the ops manager, my boss, and driving down to the data center south of Seattle and going in and dealing with a uh, machine that had gone bad because the data center had had a fire. And like, that was like, it was a big deal. We were offline mm -hmm. for three hours. And if we had a been in the cloud and B been using container based technology, it wouldn't have been that bad. We may have lost a little bit of time due to database replication to get to a different data center. But even if we had set up a proper disaster recovery with a replica, with a replica uh, at another data center, which is considered best practice at this point, we wouldn't have lost hardly any time at all. And that's the idea that it's, that it's that a, that's mm -hmm. possible and B unlike five years ago when that seemed really hard and required a lot of um, just duplicating effort, having hot, hot swappable servers on that you're not using. You don't have to do that anymore. If you have the container image up, getting it up and running is, you know, 10 minute process in a different data center for your provider, possibly even less. Right. Yeah. And people who are listening might be like, some may be nodding and some, some may be going, no, that's, oh, that's exaggeration. But it, it really isn't because once you, you yeah. know, all of the, all the Lego pieces are here now. We've got, you know, durable storage that we can rely on and we've got just the right layers of abstraction. And, you know, whether you do decide to pick, you know, Docker Swarm and Compose or whether you decide to use Apache Mesos or whatever, do whatever thing that you pick, it, it does appear that the cloud vendors are allowing for choice. Like uh, one of the teams that I worked on was a pa uh, was an Azure container service. And, you know, you might go, oh, no, it's going to be Microsoft Azure and they're going to make you use their stuff. But it uses Swarm and it uses Mesos and you can pick the one that makes you happy. So then theoretically, you could run a container on Google Cloud, you could move it to AWS, you could move it to Azure, and it would just behave the same way everywhere. And presumably then they compete not based on their on their um, container yeah, tooling because that would be all um, open some source. Is, there right? is some container tooling that's closed source. Some of the some of the vendors are putting out their own container mm -hmm. services that are closed source. Um, and even Kubernetes, the hosted version, has some closed source components, but the base underlying Kubernetes is entirely open source and completely developed in the open. That's one of the big things is that all the bugs and everything are tracked in the open and it's community based. Um, and the whole idea of that right. is that containers seem like they're a really, really good way to solve a lot of the problems that folks are having and specifically a lot of the problems that are preventing folks from adopting the cloud because they don't want to be locked in. And if, you know, the, the promise of containers is, and thus far I've seen it to be true, that you can package this thing up and pick it up and take it somewhere else if your provider isn't doing what you want. If your provider doesn't have a data center in the region that you need, or if, you know, it's just going to be cheaper to move it elsewhere. And I think everyone benefits, at least all the big cloud providers benefit when people have choice because it will encourage cloud providers to make better tools. And it will also let folks do actually do cross cloud for real because it, it, it just seems not unwise for a really big site with really strict uptime requirements to necessarily put all of their, uh, all of their eggs in one basket, so to speak. I know there are folks doing it and I know there are folks doing it very successfully. Um, but I also know that if you're not one of the huge players, uh, it's frequently easier to sell your management chain on the cloud. If you can sell them on something that's cross cloud that you can promise to them that if one of your providers has a bad day, you're not going to be completely out of luck. And at least that was my experience. We had a lot of problems selling folks on the cloud uh, both at the startup I worked at for five years and also um, when I was consulting. And if once we were able to convince them that we could, would happily support mm -hmm. a cross-cloud solution where one provider was the disaster recovery for the other, they were much more willing to accept the cloud as opposed to having to, mm -hmm. opposed to wanting to buy and maintain their own hardware. And we wanted them to be on the cloud just because it made it easier for us to manage and it made it easier for us to upgrade systems and Debatably, we thought it was more cost effective um, because it let us scale the system down when we weren't um, using it. A lot of the products I've worked on have very particular time-based load curves. And being able to dynamically scale really helps with costs. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of advantages. And I really think containers, while they're a buzzword, I do think that for a lot of people, they're at least worth investigating to see if it might 
solve some of the current pain process, pain mm-hmm. prop points in your deployment process or in your ops story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really like the way that it formalizes responsibilities. Like the part of this conversation that has resonated with me the most is the uh, the idea of choice, but also the idea of responsibilities. Like what's DevOps real job and where's the clean, bright line between what they do and what I do as a developer. But then from a container perspective, like what's the job of the operating system? What's, jo- what's What does the app represent? How cleanly is it packaged? And what's the job of the cloud that the thing sits on? And ultimately who owns your... Uh, who owns your uptime, right? You know, you do. And uh, if, if you want to go with a hybrid cloud, with a cloud as a, with another cloud provider as a backup, that's absolutely your right. And you should yeah, exactly. have it's, a technology um, stack that supports that. Hopefully formalize, I mean, my big hope is that this will make everything a little cleaner and a little easier and a lot less messy in between the steps of making something cool and sharing that something cool with the rest of the world. And we'll see. I mean, this is still new days for a lot of this technology. I mean, Kubernetes only went 1.0 last fall, I believe. And Docker Swarm and Compose, that's, I mean, the, all that stuff's under active development. The container services from other cloud providers are under active development. And I'm guessing in the next six months to a year, maybe longer, I'm not a prognosticator. It will start, it will be starting to see some best practices in this area. And I definitely have some opinions and I've shared some of them. But I'm also just curious to see what people do with this, what people do with this technology and how it helps them make cool things faster. Yeah, it definitely seems like it's it's here to stay. It's not just buzzwords. Yeah, I definitely agree. Cool. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today. This was lovely. Thank you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 